This is DJ745 for World of Reggae here in Kingston, Jamaica for a reggae history reasoning with the First Lady of Reggae, Sister Marcia Griffiths. I'd like you to welcome you to all of our viewers. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. It always is because I feel that you have so much knowledge, so much of an insight that you can give into just that very small career that's only 55 years long. <laughs> that's right. I've done a long journey. I think it's a long journey, 55 years. And as I said, I shall sing as long as I live. So I still have many years, many journeying to do. I mean, when I sort of think about it, there's not many artists in the history of Jamaican music that can have that accomplishment of being active for 55 years, let alone a female artist. Well, that is very true. I've been told that so often. Because as a matter of fact, I'm not sure if maybe Freddie McGregor is an artist that has been around for a long time and is consistent mm. as myself. But I knew F Freddie when he came to Studio One the first time. I was already there. So I don't think Freddie, you know, he's one of the long-standing artists. Okay. But for real, I don't think there's another woman, which I've been told that has done 55 years and still is consistent with a third generation absolutely and you know from ourselves at world of reggae we really do have to give thanks for you taking some time out of your day today to just sit down and just reason a little bit for the younger generations about how things were for you for myself personally this is the first time that i'm actually going to be doing a reasoning with a mother and a son because we spoke to your son the chemist only two weeks ago in the uk yeah. so you know we've reasoned that's a couple of times yeah that's very interesting very interesting. My son, um, incidentally, all three sons that I have, they are musically inclined. But I usually encourage them from they were young to get an education, you know, first, <clears throat> before they start thinking. Because I was just saying that just this morning that it's not every person who has children who is, you know, musically inclined. Mm. Your children don't have to be, you know... A part of it, if, if it's not a God-given talent, because something is going to go wrong. And I would prefer people choosing to be a part of the music if they have a God-given talent. And they want to send messages to the world through the medium of the music. So I would encourage my children, you know, I can recognize if there's a God-given talent and encourage them. Or say, listen, find your calling that God gave to you. You know, but I find that a lot of the entertainers, children, I would say children of the stars, they are Bob Marley kids are very talented, of course. But a lot of children of stars, their calling might be somewhere else, you know, True. to be a designer or a tailor, a fashion, you know, whatever. whatever but not music but I am thankful that my son is naturally talented you know the chemist if I should say so myself because he has been producing for quite a few you know brick and lace quite a few mm. artists and I've known um, producers who want to collab with him to do because they know of his worth yeah. very very true now I want to try and understand who Marcia Griffiths is. I mean, you stand strong here in 2019. How does Marcia Griffiths spend her day when you're not on tour, when you're not in the studio? What is it that, that you know, keeps your mind active? Well, I, my day is always full. Sometimes I wish it was a longer day because I'm always active. But if I'm not active, I spend most of my time with my children and I'm always in the kitchen okay always in the kitchen right okay. for example when you came this morning i wasn't you know right away because i was finishing up in the kitchen okay i love cooking so i spend a lot of time at home if i'm not on the road you know mm. touring or whatever is there any particular style of cooking that you really enjoy well i try to eat very healthy because you're yeah, what you eat so i like to experiment with 
good food lots of veggie stir fry veggie and i try to do at least 80 percent raw okay like raw juices green juice and i balance it with a little stir fry little tofu but i can i can actually make any jamaican dish if you so desire that sounds like an invitation to me <laughs> well of course you're welcome to taste it for yourself mm -hmm. let's go back a little bit now you spent your early formative years growing up in hannah town what was life like back then before 1962 before independence for you as a youth it was the most beautiful time of my life. That early years, I was born and raised in Hannatown. And those days were days that I remember when Jesus said, when, when they were crucifying Jesus and he said, if things like these happening in times when it's green, can you imagine when it's dry? Well, those days were green days. You were free to walk. You didn't have to look behind you or have any fear and it was just perfect love everyone was just it was a neighbor thing mm. your neighbor is your family okay you know and it was just some beautiful beautiful times that i wish i could relive mm. but i'll just cherish those days do you feel that in the society that we live in now especially at the moment with everyone being connected on mobile phones social media we've lost some of those family values oh, those values i mean values never change i usually tell people that values money can't buy values mm. you know health life class honesty love these are values that money will never buy but this today's day is not my thing because we used to survive without cell phones and we used to communicate there wasn't a problem no all these things that you know mankind brought about and electronic devices is just another means of a slow death mm. so it's not my thing i use it because you know i want to be you know with, with the, the times time. right. but still try to be careful how i use it that sounds like sound advice but these times are really some serious times you know mm. with serious things that they implement in the world mm. to take you away quicker <laughs> <laughs> well look this is a, a reggae history reasoning about you and everything that you've achieved now 55 years ago almost to the day easter monday yeah. let's talk about that easter monday in 1964. wow I am so glad that I'm still able to think about it, cherish the moment, and I have frozen that moment in my mind and my head because it's a moment that can never leave my mind. I walked on stage Easter Monday morning with Byron Lee and the Dragoneers and I sang No Time to Lose. That was a popular song in Jamaica then because I was just given the chance to do one song because Byron would never accept another artist, especially a no-name artist coming on his stage at that late stage. And Philip James of the Blues Buses was the one who discovered me, heard me singing and insist that I do the show. They were also on the show, Blues Buses. And after all the begging and pleading that he did with Byron, I went to the rehearsal and I rehearsed one little song. And the morning I walked out there as a little girl, 11 years, yeah, my birthday is in November. Okay. So I wasn't 11 as yet. And I stood there waiting on the guitar to start the song, because that's how the song starts. And nothing was happening. And as a young, inexperienced person, I was looking around, you know, questioning, say, what's going on? And they were laughing. So I know that this was a direct sabotage. Okay. And a voice said to me, even from that young age, God was always there. And I hear a voice say, little girl, you better start sing. And that's when I started to sing the song. 
without them and they had to follow right. me. And in those days, when you try to emulate any singer, especially a female doing another female song, you try to cross every T and dot every I. You want to sound exactly, exactly. like the singer. So if you close your eyes that morning, you would think Carla Hello. Thomas was on stage. Right. So every t I'm singing the harmonies and I'm singing the melody. And because the audience, have, they never heard anything like that. And every slur and every turn, I would do it exactly. And every time I make a slur and a turn, the, the whole audience went up in like the roof was lifting off. And I was just there singing and innocent. And I was nervous or anything because I wanted to show them what I could do. I had no doubt in myself. So when the song was finished, my goodness. I was overwhelmed with the audience and they insist, Tony Verity was the MC and they insist to bring me back and Tony went on the mic and said she never have anything else to do and they said bring her back for the same <laughs> song. I didn't go back though but um, that very same day Linford Anderson took me to Studio One right. and that was just walking distance from Carib Theatre. And I went to Studio One, never had any audition, went straight in the studio and I recorded a song called Wall of Love. It was written by Newton. He was a guy living in the same place I was living on Oxford Street. He was supposed to be a part of the song too, but he was nervous. So they asked me, you know, said, little girl, you know the song? So I said, yes. He was even threatening me afterward and said, you know, I take his song and sing it. And, but he was nervous. Mm. That song is still on tape. Never released. Nice. So the rest is history in Studio One. I started recording song after song. And Mr. Dodd, I remember, he was so overwhelmed with my talent that he wanted to collaboration you know, with different male artists. I did collaborations with Tony Gregory, Free Eye, Bob Andy, and another guy from a small island, Owen Boyce. Mm. But he was just doing everything, but nothing happened before the time. So my first hit song there was 1967, Feel Like Jumping. Mm -hmm. What were your first impressions of Cox and Dodd? Because, you know, when we have these reggae history reasonings, People have different opinions and different mindsets about Cox and Dodd. What was your impressions back then? Even when I met this man, I thought he was doing a great job. Because as a little girl, hearing all these hit songs, and I was standing at the place, the foundation where all these songs originate. So I thought this man was the greatest man. And even today... I have nothing negative to say about him because what that man has done I think he was innocent like most of us too they, everybody was fussing about not getting paid including myself but then when you grow and you understand because he said that they were robbing him as well mm. but you know what the most important thing is he gave me an opportunity he gave me the baton then and I just took it and ran with it mm. so more power may god rest his soul and may his music just continue to feed right. souls you know yeah, yeah. i heard that at the time when you did the performance in 1964 on the easter monday there was almost like a there was two different sides trying to pull to sign you to record so i heard that byron lee also wanted to get you to sign for him yeah, because he himself was shocked when he heard my because he was one of them that said to to Bosi no we don't want anybody else no no singer and you know he was one of the persons who was fighting, fighting that I wouldn't come on the show so between his manager Ronnie Nasrallah and Coxon they were both fighting to sign me but of course I went along with Mr. Dodd, you know, and my father liked him because okay. my father was playing a major role in all of this, you mm. know, because I'm a young little girl underage. Mm. But I still ended up being a vocalist for Byron Lee's band. Mm. 
I mean, at Studio One is where you very first met the Whalers, Bob, Peter yes. and Bunny. Um, you even recorded a song with Bob Marley, Oh My Darling. Right, yes. But when I went there and I met Bob and Peter and Sister Rita and all the rest of them, Heptones, I knew Bunny from childhood days, kindergarten. Okay. I would wait at my gate for Bunny to come up and as a little girl and he would hold my hand and take me to a little school. We used to call it little, that's prep school. Prep school. So I knew him. He was the only person I knew there at the time when I went there. So it was good to see him. But the, these three brothers were just some serious militant guys, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it seemed like they were really fun times because at the start of Oh My Darling, they've got the, the little tape rolling where I think you're actually saying Chaman. Yeah, he was, he was messing around with me. Okay. And I was saying Chaman. <laughs> <laughs> So I think, you know, for, for me as a as an enthusiast of Jamaican music, you know, you kind of just sort of pick up on some of these things outside of the song itself. And you think to yourself, yes. they were having a good time. Yes, we were. Come but on. it's funny. I never even realized that Mr. Dodd left that in because that should not have been a part of the song. But he left it in and that's how it starts. It starts. Okay. <laughs> I mean, back then, you know, in the mid '60s, there wasn't that many other female singers. So we probably had what Doreen Schaefer, Phyllis Dillon at Treasure Isle, Martin Hortense. Ellis, you know, just a few. And I think Patsy was there. Okay. Yeah, with Miss Pottinger. Mm. But there were just a few singers. Few, few. Hortense was one of the main singers on stage shows only. Phyllis used to record at. Treasure Isle and um, Doreen was with Scatterlights. Mm. So from then it was always a male dominated thing. thing. Mm. You, you mentioned a few moments ago about your first hit record 1967 Feel Like Jumping. Yeah. What a song that is and how did that come about? Did you write it or did Bob Andy have a role to play? Because I know he contributed a lot of the writing yeah. of the songs that you made. Yeah, it was a combination with Bob Andy and Jackie Me Too, who was the guy who plays the piano at Studio One. So it was both of them that came up with that idea. It was a nice rhythm and, you know, a happy song. I mean, your first sort of like meetings or interactions with Bob Andy, who I know that you've spent so many times with, even up to this day, you know, you're very good friends. Yeah. What, what were your first memories with Bob Andy? I met Bob Andy as a part of the Paragons group. A friend of mine took me to the rehearsal in Rockford in the 63, I think. But I was just one little girl there. My sister, my older sister, was living there. And we all walked to listen to, you know, this group, this group. rehearsing. And I, was, I said to them, I can sing, you know. I never forget that night. <laughs> I said to the Paragons, I can sing, you know. And one of the guys said, yeah, what you can sing? And I said, I can sing Patti LaBelle. So I sang Down the Isle for them. So when I next saw these guys at Studio One, when they walked in and saw me, he said to the rest of the guys, hey, look who's here, Patti LaBelle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he remembered me. So that's when I met Bob first. Right. So when he came to Studio One, that's when he started, Mr. Dodd, and ask him to write songs. So, Mr. Dad was so anxious for me to get hit songs, and Feel Like Jumping was not even one of the songs we were thinking about. So, we didn't put all that energy. But when you're not making the effort, it happens. Mm. So, that's when Bob and he started writing all my songs Melody Life, Tell Me No, Truly Mark My Word. All those songs were written by Bob. So that was just the beginning of a lot of beautiful moments, moments. you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of people say that Bob Andy is probably one of the most consistent and most prolific songwriters. Right. How do you think he gets that skill him, himself? Where does it come from? That is something, a God-given talent. He didn't learn that anywhere. That is something within him. He has that ability to express himself lyrically and with good melody mm. and 
you know, we have a few singers right here that is so talented, like Beris Hammond is the same person. Right. I've never seen Beris with a pen and a paper. Mm. But he just goes behind the microphone and that's it. Mm. Even for my songs that Beris wrote, he's not writing anything. Mm. He just tell you what to sing. Mm. I mean, I spoke to Beris Hammond recently and he said, I don't write songs, I vibe songs. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, yeah. I've seen him, you know, in, on many occasions and that's what he does. Yeah. Just like Bob Andy, I saw Bob Andy stand behind the microphone and Rupert Edwards put on a rhythm, The Way I Feel, that song that is called The Way I Feel, and Bob stand behind that microphone and just sing that song from beginning to end. Change. Lyrics and melody. Okay. Okay. So I say all of that to say this, that when one is talented, you know, from the Almighty God, it's unlimited. You know, there's so much you can do. Mm. And I think Bob is really a great songwriter. Very, very good. We'll definitely second that, of course. Yeah, I know. <laughs> now, here in 2019, we're talking about Studio One, things that happened 50 or 55 years ago. Um, you have a brand new album coming out in the summer of 2019, which is called Timeless. Now, I'm really excited. I haven't heard it, but I'm so excited just hearing about it. Yes, Timeless is an album that says Marcy Griffith sings Studio yeah. One. I think the best music, some of the best music, almost a hundred percent, I call Studio One Jamaica's Motown. And the best music came out of Studio One. And I find that every time I think about Studio One, I remember when they were celebrating 50 years, Cool FM did a special to Studio One. And let me tell you, I was overwhelmed I couldn't believe some of the songs that I loved from a little girl and I never even know that this was Studio One right. production I mean some of the greatest entertainers and songs so I decide that I want to pick a few songs and record them over, over. and that's what we actually did and few of the tracks I have like Toots doing one of his song I'll never grow old he did a verse with me okay on it okay and some of the other songs that I know are that are going to be featured include you know classics like Heptones baby be true yes. um, the Abyssinians declaration of rights right. um, I think Delroy Wilson as well yeah. um, the cables what kind of world yeah. Ken Booth's um, home yes. which is one of my favorite on the album mm. It must have been quite a difficult decision because, as you just mentioned, that the catalogue at Studio One is it's it's like a music genre in itself. Wow. How did you how did you pick those fifteen songs? It was very very hard, and even today, even though they are nice songs, I still believe that they are so because you notice most of these artists. I think Barry Hammond and quite a few others have so many hit songs on Studio One rhythm. Right. Donovan German has a lot to mm -hmm. because even answer that I am singing on I shall sing it's a studio yeah. one rhythm a lot of the rhythms that you the, you know artists hit on is from studio, studio one. one so I still think that there's a lot more in that the, you know that's that's a treasure mm. full of it's like a jackpot <laughs> full of you know and it's never empty you cannot empty that mm, mm. so I still feel satisfied that I chose the songs I did and there's more to come mm, mm. but I'm happy with the tracks that I chose well we're certainly going to be very excited to hear the songs when they are released in June of 2019 and it's coming out before. before okay yeah. I think it's coming up between April next month and May I requested for them to Speed, speed up, up the, the release yeah okay. and i've also heard that as well as obviously being available digitally which is how music is there's also going to be yeah. physical yeah. cds and vinyl yes yes yeah. definitely definitely the musicians that were used so this project is in combination with donovan germain penthouse yeah. 
used some younger musicians as well on this? Well, in my entire journey, especially when you're growing older, you have to collab with a young generation. And I love the energy from the youth. Mm. So I guess that's one of my secrets for being relevant and staying with the times because I love to work with the young talent. So we have a mixture with young musicians. And of course, we can never leave out Sly and Robbie. True. You know, so the musicians... We change them up, you know, from time to time, depending on the kind of rhythm, rhythm. that we lean. But mm. they're all great musicians. Mm. Mm. All great. great. Let's do this. Let's take a little drive from 13 Brentford Road. Let's drive up towards Roosevelt Avenue. Harry J's. Yeah. <laughs> that was my second stop on my journey. From Brentford Road, I moved on to Harry J. Roosevelt. Mm. And that's where, that's a, that's, a, that's a producer that Bob would tell you as well. We had, we were very blessed and fortunate to have quite a few hits with Harry J. Our biggest hit was Young, Gifted and Black. Right. That was what, 1969, so making that 50 years, another milestone. That's right, mm. that's right. Mm. That song, I mean, obviously it got into the number two spot in the UK charts. As a, as, a, as a young girl growing up, how did you come to hear that your song that you recorded here at Roosevelt Avenue with Bob Andy was now doing really big things internationally? Well, that moment for me was a little difficult because I, prior to that, before we heard that the song was a hit in, in England... I went to Germany with Fab Five, who was then called the Reggae's. Okay. This man came from Germany, Mr. Huber, heard us playing at Sombrero and signed us up to come and do some days in Munich. So that's where I was. And um, I recorded a complete album there and two tracks in German language with a 30-piece orchestra. Wow. So I signed a new contract with this man now to come back when I returned to Jamaica to go back to Germany to do tours and more recordings. And would you believe that when I came back, that's when we got the news about the song being number two on the British charts and we have to leave now to go to London to do Top of the Pops. I am now preparing to return to, Ger to, to Germany. Germany. So you can imagine the position I was in at that time. So I chose going to London with Bob to go on top of the Pops. And we were there, we had a beautiful experience. You know, it was, everything was just happening and I'm so overwhelmed because here we are in England on top of the Pops doing a big song in England at our Biggest audience was some white guys called the Skinhead. Mm. Anyway, we moved on to go to different parts in the UK. And I think we're, I was in Amsterdam doing a television show. And out of nowhere appeared this man that I was signed to, Mr. Huber. From Germany. Because I breached the contract I had with him and went to London instead of coming back to Germany. And the man insists that I am not doing that. It was one big ordeal mm. because he showed them the contract that I have with him. And he said the only way that I was allowed to do the show is unless I sign right now to leave immediately to go back go to back. Germany because he had dates booked. So everything was just happening and it was so confusing. I'm a young little girl and everything just going. So Bob and they went with me and we said, OK, because we had to go through with the television show in Amsterdam. So everything was just right there before me, up and down. And I loved London and I just wanted to return to London. And um, but I had to go and make my I had a commitment in Germany he had a couple of dates very important 
that he wasn't able to cancel. So I went and I fulfilled those right. dates and came back to London. And then we decided that we would reside there for a while. That's when we came up with a second hit song called Pied Piper. Okay. How many years did you spend living in London? One, almost two years. Okay. Yeah, almost two years. It must have been a very different experience to life in Kingston because, you know, London is, is a very, very sort of like happening place. But, you know, for yourself, it must have been very different. What, what is it you liked about London? Nobody could understand why I love London because it was always dark, drizzly right. and, you know, you hardly see sunshine. But something was there that I couldn't put my fingers on. So I always wonder if I was there in another life. All kind of things came to me because I, I was a person who think more than how I talk. So I sat down many days and I said, I wonder if I was here in another life. And then I met, a, I met this white guy in some mall. And he just stopped me one day and said, if I knew that I was an Egyptian. And I said, no, I'm a Jamaican. And he said, no. You're an Egyptian, and he was telling us a lot of things. Bob was there as well. And I started to look deeper and think more about myself. And I say, I know there's another life, but I couldn't identify or I couldn't put my fingers. But I just love that place. Something inside of me relate mm. to, the to the place. And up until this day, I don't know, because I find that if I'm back here in the West, certain time of the day like five six that's when i want to sleep that's the only time i feel sleep because i've been suffering from insomnia for some 40 or 50 years okay and i only want to sleep at that time so I, all that now going through my mind and saying i wonder if i am my body's programmed for another Time zone. Play time zone. Right, okay. So, you know, I'm always thinking about these things. Mm. But I loved it, loved it very much. Okay, okay. Now, 1974 was another important year, I feel, because that's the time when the I3s came together to be Bob's supporting singers. How did you, Rita and Judy, first come together? When did you first meet? Well, of course, I told you I met Sister Rita in 1964 when I went to Studio, Studio One. One. But I don't think Judy had started anything as mm -hmm. yet. So Rita and myself were very close from that time. And Mr. Dodd invited, I think Judy's group was now somewhere in the 60, maybe 68, somewhere about there. Her group, the Gaylets, were established <coughs> at that time. Mr. Dodd invited us to come and do, Rita and myself, to come to Studio One to do some harmonies on somebody's song. Can't remember who it is, but he also invited Judy. Okay. So all three of us met at Studio, Studio One, One and we did the harmonies on the song. And then that particular weekend, I was appearing at the House of Chen in New Kingston for the weekend. And I just out of the clear blue asked them if they would come and do some harmony and they were excited for me. And we got together very quickly and because the songs that I was doing was popular songs that they already knew. Sweet Inspirations and my songs, of course, were songs that they were familiar with. And they came Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And the last night, we decided to just do a little jam on stage. And we started jamming Sweet Inspiration song. And the audience loved it. Mm -hmm. And they were excited and said, why you girls don't form a group? But I was already there as a solo Hello. artist. Rita was Solets, her group, and Judy was the Gaylets. So they kept saying why you girls you sound so good as a group form a group and thing and we said all right and we decided say let's do it it can't hurt so that's when we came together and the first performance we did was on a gospel show at, at the arena and i think bob heard that we were performing there as a group we never had any name then 
And I think that particular time they were having a fallout with Peter and Bunny. Some dispute, I don't know what it was. And we went in to do Natty Dread. And we decided that we would find a name for the group. And I said, let's call ourselves I3. And Rita said, I3? And I said, yes, it's like saying we three. But instead of saying we three, we say I3. And Brother Bunny was present and he said, yes, because it's, you know he, he had a lot of explanation for it, why it should be I3. And we said, yes. So we just hold on to that name. And from we went in with bob to do natty dread the following maybe not a complete year when his majesty passed we went in and we did jaliv and we ended up doing the entire natty dread album and i was saying boy you notice when we start working with bob everything is just hit after hit after hit and then of course, the rest is history. We became his three little birds mm. that he loved and, you know, really cared about. Mm. A lot of people say that Bob had a very, very hard or strong work ethic. How was it for you three little girls then, or the three little birds, working alongside Bob? Who, you know, he, he seems to be someone that kind of like, he slept music, he, he walked, he lived music all day. Everything. That was his life. Music was his life. Nothing came before his music. He just, he had that determination. He knew what his aim, he was just focused on what he wanted to do. And as I said, there were three revolutionary brothers, you know, and they were the voice of the people. Everything that they wanted to get out there in the world was what you and I, everybody else, were experiencing, you know. Sometimes we hear a song and we feel like the singer is speaking directly to us. It's because we have lived it. Mm. We are the same people, feeling the same pain. So he was determined and Bob was just, nothing else mattered. No money, nothing came before his music. And he was so determined. And I remember I had already been established. I was already... Right. In England, and I remember when he made his first trip to London, he came back and we were sitting around by RG and he said, you guys are big in England. And I said, yeah, we had a song there and he, he never realized that we were, you know, as popular. Okay. So when I f joined the, with the i Street and started working with Bob, um, I was already, you know, established in England with Bob Andy. And... For some reason, I said to, to Rita and Judy, this, all of this that's happening is no mistake. It is ordained by Almighty God. Serious thing. Because even the way how we came together was so strange. And then at that time, Bob, Peter and Bonnie had their differences and he, we just came right in at the right, right time. time. Mm. And we became permanent with Bob all over the world. We were like missionaries on a mission from God with this man. And when I saw how serious this man took his music, that is when my eyes became open to realize that the music was not a fun. I mean, music is life. But then Bob showed me a different side when I saw how it was his life, then I started to think now and say, the whole thing is the message in the music that we are sending through the medium of this music. We can reach to the four corners of the earth, which is what he did mm. eventually. And then I started thinking about myself and the lyrics, the message that I'm sending out as a woman. So I have to give credit to Bob for opening my eyes to realize that when you are chosen and have a God-given talent and you're in the position that you can communicate to the world, it is so important that we send 
good message to teach and educate right. and uplift. Because that's the only way we can communicate. That's the biggest vehicle and it's the strongest weapon that we have on earth today. So I don't take it for granted. And we see that until this day, Bob's music is now just manifesting the things that he sang about. We can relate to them just as if we read a Bible verse and we see it's manifesting today. Mm. So I always say that I am thankful that I was privileged to be a part of that experience yes. because that part of my journey is the most memorable, one of the most memorable part in my journey, yes. 55 years mm. with Bob. So if I was to ask you then, what is your most memorable moment of Bob Marley? Wow, that's not easy. Mm -mm. After spending so many years working with Bob, there are so many moments, very, very special moments. And one moment that I always talk about, I'm sure everybody know about this one, is when I was on stage. And that is one of the moments that I also realized that this man was not an ordinary man. I was pregnant maybe about seven or a little more and I was out there dancing up a storm. I think lively up yourself and I wasn't supposed to be dancing so hectic but I remember after the song finished the next song that came was No Woman No Cry and Bob put his guitar on the stand and the song started but by the time I saw all of this happening I felt my stomach just get very stiff and the place I saw Peeny Wally some little lights before my eyes and I know that this is fainting time mm. I I'm, was about to collapse so I held on to Sister Rita dress and I said Rita I'm going to faint but we can't talk or anything, you know, it's, we, we have to be very militant up there. And when I hold on to our skirt, and I know say, I'm going to call it, the place has got dark. Can I tell you that? Before I fell, who that I feel Bob's arm around my shoulder. And I'm not talking about Bob, look and see that I'm going to faint and him running up. He was just slowly coming over with his microphone and he was doing ad libs about the mothers and the children all over the world mm. because of my condition, of course. And just before I went down, his arm was around my. And I cannot tell you how frightened I was shocked. I was instantly rejuvenated. And up until this moment, I know that was the work of the Almighty God. Because usually Bob's eyes are closed when he's singing. Mm. But he, for some reason, I can't work it out. He just walked over to us and started doing the ad-libs. And before I fell, he was right there. And he took me away from where I was standing with the other two sisters took me center stage and he was still doing ad libs about children and all that and I was able to walk center stage with him and then he took me back to my position and I almost wasn't able to finish the show because I was just amazed I am saying no I've never seen nothing for me telling you no it's a totally different thing from you experience yes yeah. Because I know that something was not normal. Mm. There's no way he could reach to me and save me from falling, not knowing what's happening to me. And I was about to go and, you know, fall. Oh. So even after the show, I said, no, I hasten to find out from him what inspired him to come right. over to me. Because I have to tell him what was taking place that he didn't know. And I, could, I, I, I couldn't even ask him because I know he's 
he's not the person that you can ask her. He's always on a different level, a different planet when he's on stage. He's not even conscious of some of the things and the movements. So I did ask him and he wasn't able to tell me why he came, but the spirit just moved him mm-hmm. at the right time. And I now started to tell him what was happening to me and how he saved me from falling. Mm-hmm. And he was very happy to know that. But he was just learning at the time. So that was one of my special moments, moments. with Bob. And even traveling with Bob on the bus, the things that Bob would say would amaze me because I said, no normal person don't talk like that. You know, even the things sometimes that he tell us to sing, it wouldn't be anything like ooh or ah, which is what everybody does. Mm. He would find something totally different. different that you wonder oh this man would come up with those strange sounds but we did it and it worked, it worked. Perfect. perfect so even from that time i knew that this man i usually say i gave him flowers while he was alive I d- he didn't have to pass for me to know who he was i knew that that man was truly sent when that man hit the stage even if you are not present and you are outside, you know exactly when he hit the stage. The audience just went on a different level. Mm. He took it somewhere, somewhere else. else. Mm. I guess that's a little bit like what happened in Zimbabwe. Oh my Lord, yes. Because when we found out eventually what caused the, the stampede and everything, it was because they heard Bob Marley playing in the stadium and they are locked out. Mm. So they flatten the fence. And that's when the soldiers use the tear gas. Yes. Yeah, that's how contagious this man and his music was all over the world. Mm. Mm. Let's go to probably what I would say is probably one of the the not so good times. That, but we have to talk about it. The final concert in Pittsburgh in 1980. Were you aware that Bob was sick at that time? Well, none of us, we were only aware that he collapsed after the show in, at the Madison. And we went on, our second stop on the tour was Pittsburgh. And we went ahead, waiting to see Bob come. And can't see Bob come in. And then Rita got a call that um, he was not well. And... Uh, that's when we started getting a little worried. But finally, in the evening, he arrived. And when I looked at, when we looked at him, he was not the same person. He was looking really, really strange. And he managed to go on stage. I remember that evening, Sister Judy will tell you the same thing. We did a sound check for like maybe two hours singing one song. I'm hurting inside. Mm. And I just, you, I mean, once you are spiritually aware, you just know that something deep down, something is not, not right. right. And I just wanted to cry because I know that song is a song that it speaks for itself and even if he's not saying certain things you know you know verbally to us he says it in his music and i could pick up that something was definitely wrong and we went on see that night and he he gave one of the longest performance i think we went on stage for three encores that night I remember the third time that he was going because we were tired ourselves and he said well I trees I say but if we say we weren't going back he would never go back but we went back with him mm. and he gave his all that night as you say in the song the tribute he's a legend 
he is a legend always I cannot I personally I cannot see that man no other way but a man that was truly sent by the Almighty God to do the work he did because I've never seen another one like Bob mm. who just he, he, he would lock out everything else and just just his music, music. Mm. nothing came before it that's his life that was his life just to get the word out there and the music the message that was all mattered as he said if money come money come that's not what he was in it for mm. he was on a mission from God and I think he fulfilled you know what God wanted him to do mm. and I always say long live his message his spirit and his music continually True. now whilst you were working alongside brother Bob Marley and the i3s you were also still recording as a solo artist and sometimes I try and wonder in my mind how did you find the time to do so many things I mean you know you were working with Miss Pottinger on the albums naturally yeah. and stepping and I think to myself you must have been spending so much time on the road and then yet still finding time to make your own music yes. That's so true, but one thing for sure, I never relinquish my solo career at no time. Whether I'm with a Bob and Marcia, or a I3 or Bob Marley on the road, my solo career, I always manage to maintain. I always have something out there, mm. you know, regardless of where I might be and with who, whether it's a group or a duet, I never relinquish my solo career. And Miss Pottinger was one of the few producers that I really liked working with you know mm. as another female I've never experienced working with because she had some good nice words mm. to comfort us Judy and myself work with her and she's always telling us nice things things from the Bible you know and we just felt comfortable working with my uh, and she was the only female producer at the time so we really supported her. I did two albums with her. Mm. And these were recorded at the location of Treasure Isle, Bond Street. Yes, 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 yeah. yeah. That's where we recorded all, all those songs. Mm. I mean, on some of those albums, or the, you revisited some of your Studio One material. Um, why yeah. did you choose to revisit some of those songs again? Because... Um, at that time we thought they are good songs and they were not given the proper chance to see what you know to the fullness and the songs I did though there are some songs that Bob Andy wrote himself to but I just thought they were not given proper promotion and you know we just wanted to allow those songs to do naturally you know what we think the potential of the they songs deserve. yeah right. okay okay and around this time as well um you also recorded this album called kemar yeah yeah uh bob and marcia yeah, right okay yeah well just give the viewers an insight what, what what does kemar mean to you well you know it's funny that you say that i am so sorry i never register that name okay because today any child that you hear with that name, I am the one who created that name for my son. That's my son's name. And a friend of mine who we were living together in Oak Ridge, she came up with the name. It's my name and Keith. Keith. That's how we came up with the Kemar. And the first time I gave that little child that name, the lady, oh, our neighbor's daughter was pregnant. She had a son and she gave him this, the name. Mm -hmm. And my friend had a son and he gave this son the name. And everybody seemed to just love the name and start talking. Everybody's son was Kemar Kemar. now. <laughs> and no, but I should have. There's not a Kemar right now with the, at the age of my son. Right. They're all younger. younger. 
I am so sorry I never already said that <laughs> name. <laughs> but that's how it came, came about. about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, you know, real reggae history because I never realized that. So yeah. thank you for sharing that insight with us. 1983, Electric Boogie, the song that in 1989 kind of like came back as a different version and it created this whole storm, particularly in the came United... As in it was revisited in 1989 with as the Electric Slide it was done originally in 83 Three. right? right i need to tell you the story of this song very quickly i3 went to canada to do a performance and of course it's a male dominated business and they disrespect women treat women try to treat women less but we try to stand up for our rights and we never have any manager at the time so we ended up getting 700 dollars canadian each so my little seven hundred dollars i had it walked downtown and i went in the store and saw this little rhythm box and i just fell in love with the box i think it was for like three something so i bought that rhythm box out of my it was like a keyboard mm. but it had every sound every beat everything hawaiian samba repeater so I discovered this song on the rhythm box called the repeater song. It's a piano going ning 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 ning. So when I took it to Jamaica, Bonnie and I, of course, I said we would go way back, and he always visit me, bring nice fresh fruits from his farm in Portland. I showed him this rhythm box, and I said, "Brother Bonnie, look at this rhythm box," and I showed him the the song I discovered with the beat, and he just loved it. He taped it took the cassette to Portland and I don't know what inspired him at the time but he came back the following day with that song but the beat is already there yeah. now and the keyboard and everything and we called in Sly and Robbie and they overdub on the bass because we had bass and everything everything came from the box and that's how that song came about. came about it was spontaneous we never sit on it we never sleep on it the musicians went in and laid the thing and every keyboard that you hear on that song is from that rhythm box every single one and it's like about 10 different styles and brother bunny is playing it so when that song was released it went straight to the number one spot because the same kind of vibe that it was done is the same way it was you know when you release it it was just on um. number one and 84 no i think it's the same time chris blackwell heard the song and he came straight to jamaica and said i want that song um. and unfortunately he wanted the entire album because he found out that we were doing an album and that was part of the album but for some reason i don't know it was personal with bunny and himself he never got the album, but he still took the single and he never had any urge to promote the single because he kept saying that big companies don't promote single. Mm. They do albums and it was not given to him. So it was there going off its own strength. It was released in the Bahamas. It was in Amps. It was all over all the place. Over. Right. But they used to do the, the moonwalk dance slide. from it, that slide. Mm. But it was not until 89 when right. I was on tour, Sunsplash tour in, on the west side, California, that Dr. Dredd called me and said, Marcia, you're going to be back. I can't use the words that he said. <laughs> but you see, by the time we got to Washington, D.C., I was forced to learn the dance and perform the song on stage. <laughs> Cause it was summertime and everybody was on holiday from different parts of the United States. So how we started spreading was when they went back to their homes, they took a copy of the song and that's the dance was spread like spread. wild fire. Right. Chris Blackwell didn't even know that the song was doing so, so great. great. So right away he said, okay, Marcy, we can't, we can't jump on a single. We have to do an album. Okay. So the first track, we went to the Jerks, who was Seth, um, Gloria Estefan's um, band. 
And the first track we did, he said to them, do it exactly like the record. And we did it exactly. So while that was, you know, out there, went on the billboard, we were in the studio completing the album. album right. We couldn't find Bunny nowhere. Because when I discovered that the song was a hit song and it's really happening, we searched everywhere for Brother Bunny. And we couldn't find him nowhere because we wanted to do a video with Bunny because, you know, the, that original one, he has the yes. little part. He said, Dick Miss Kelly with electric belly. So that's what we were looking for him for. When I finally found Bunny, he was doing a video for another version that he just went in and recorded. Right. But the one that was known and what the people loved was the one that they heard, you know. So nothing could stop that song. And up until this day, it's the longest living song and dance. That, that dance has outlived the cha-cha, the Madison, the bus stop, the bossa nova, the macarena, everything. Mm -hmm. Even today. You know, so that's just a magical song and that's been going for how many? 30 years. All right. Mm. Yeah. Hey! strong some good times i think yes oh listen any song that unites people together in one body i was performing in baltimore and i saw 100,000 people doing the dance and i had to stop singing i was doing backing track i have never i almost cried mm. 100,000 because it was like a wave all the bodies were going like that yeah. that it was something to behold and I said my god look at this no partner it starts in kindergarten to the home for the age because every time we go to Washington and do the electric slide day they have contests and it starts from three years old and I have a video now with a lady 94 with our stick in the front of the line and she was doing the electric, electric slide, slide. Wow. it's amazing mm. i mean you've done so much in your career i mean all the works that you've done with people like donovan germain yeah. penthouse um and then hobbs of course uncle berris yeah the late mm -hmm. fattest you know how do you do it you're very knowledgeable Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, as I said, it's like mixing with what's happening. Because when I heard Barry Salmon first, when he just, just started, that man knocked me out with his voice. And I said to Anne, who was the owner of the tit for tat, where he was singing, I said, Anne, I have never heard a voice like that. And I said a prayer right there and then I said, boy, I wish this man could just really make it big. He was so talented when I heard that voice. So when, he, when I had the opportunity to do a, a song with Berries at Penthouse, I was so overwhelmed. I was so happy. And then in the stables of the Penthouse, I remember there was Cotty Ranks, there was Tony Rebel. Buju Bantan came as a young teenager and Wayne Wonder was there and I managed to do collabs with all of these mm. talent as a lone female in that stable. I mean, I think a few years ago you put a compilation, Marcia Griffiths and Friends, yeah. not just one and two songs, 38. Yes. Well, I now have 50. I have 50 collaborations with 50 different artists and 
that is the way I wanted to do my 50th anniversary when it was 50, you know, to do the collaboration with every single person that I've done collaboration with in decade, in the different decades. decades. Of course, the 60s, it was Bob Andy, Tony Gregory. Free Eyes, not around, but his son was ready and prepared. Kimani was ready to do that song that Bob, Bob Marley and myself did, yeah. Oh My Darling. And you know, and we come right up from the 60s, different musicians, of course, 60s, 70s. I3 came in the 70s, 80s, 90s. 90s was where we climaxed you now with all that penthouse. penthouse. Yeah. Mm. So it's very interesting. And if I may say so right now, it's 55 and we are doing it this year. So more great music to look forward to then. Oh, of course. I mean, sky's the limit and I have to endorse my words that I say, I shall sing as long as I live. So I'm just beginning. After celebrating 55, let's put it this way, I'm a Jamaica Stina Turner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm nowhere near her age, but I feel like I'm just beginning. beginning. Well, look, we have to really give thanks for spending some time with an extended reasoning here with us for World of Reggae. When you look back now and you reflect back on your life so far, is there any regrets? None whatsoever, because even unpleasant moments, they had to come about that we could appreciate the better times. So, well, I usually say the only regret for me, and I wouldn't call it a regret, but... If I said that I wish I knew then what I know now, no. then the experience would not be meaningful. Mm. But I had to experience. So I'm not going to say I wish I knew then what I know now. Because to experience it is the most beautiful time. To relive it. Even li being left in the country by the, 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 the scatter lights, as a little girl, Bob and Emma said they left us in Veer Clarendon to walk because as a young girl and you're vulnerable and all these male dominated, you're in a male dominated thing and everybody looking at a little young girl that does come on the scene. Because of Bob Andy, and he was always there with me everywhere I go, they were not happy about that. So I was left because they said they are only responsible for a singer not singer and boyfriend so even those moments i enjoyed them so i'm not going to say i regret anything whether it was good or it was bad i loved we need we need rain we need sun and rain to bring about a rainbow True. so it's a balance so i enjoy the bad times as well as I enjoy the good times. I appreciate every moment and it's all experience. Mm. I love every moment of it. And I guess that some of the, maybe the good and the bad times that you have encountered during your life are what gives the younger female singers of today. And I don't want to miss out any names, but I'm thinking of people like Sister Janine, Naomi Cowan, Savannah, Leela I.K. It, it seems like there's, a, there's an uprising of female singers, which makes me really happy. And credit is due to yourself, who was one of the founders. Well, I can sit here and tell you that the greatest achievement in the 55 years is to know, not to wonder, is to know that I've inspired so many Absolutely. women. No money could buy that and no award that I've gotten could replace that feeling to hear so many women sit or in their interviews to mention my name that I've been their inspiration from way back. So I say to myself I must have been doing something good to have inspired all these women because they would all acknowledge the fact you know that they were inspired by me. I was their role model. So I really do give thanks that I could change that whole thing being male dominated because more women felt confident to know that they could come in and do something. 
you know, and be a part of it. It was like it was a man thing. And if you, you have to be a man to be in reggae. No, mm. we all have the talent that God give us. There's no label on talent. And we want to display what we have. And I read the Bible and it says, God says, all my springs are in thee, not some. So if everything that he has is within us, we have to express it through the music. So I am thankful that I could do that little to have inspired all these ladies that they could come. You know, I have so many favorite, almost every woman in the business. I love mm. them and I endorse them. Mm. You know, I love Queen Africa. I love Tanya. I love Itana. All these young singers, even Carlene's daughter, all these singers that you just mentioned. I just love them all and I just want them to pursue and continue because we have to encourage this generation, you know. Right. I am just so, this is like a, the icing on the cake for me being here still after someone, you know, from the foundation and I'm still here sharing stage with this generation, doing collaborations with them. It's a wonderful feeling for me, you know. I wish I could just have a school and have all of them come in and just say, listen, go for it. You got it. Because we want to know that during our time and whatever we did, it was for a purpose. And this is the result. Absolutely. Yes. So I really love what they are doing. Love what they are doing. And I want to encourage them more to make sure once they are in the position, a lot of the artists don't know their potential and being in that position that you can transcend send messages. I just want to encourage them in sending the right message, message. to the world. Because as I said earlier, music is one of the most powerful weapons. It is, it can work wonders. We cannot live without music not, and we can't live without food. Those are the two things we cannot live without. So if you are blessed to be a part of it, please, we always try and beg them to make positive Positive. contribution. Mm. You last longer. Absolutely. That's the secret of longevity. Mm. You last longer. You know how my heart feels when I hear Bujo mention over and over that he never forget what I tell him about his utterance. You know, I feel so good. Really so good. I love that you so much. Because it's not a lot of people you can talk to and, you know, they feel like maybe they're too big and who are you to talk? But it shows me that he respects, you know, people like me, an elder. He respects my advice and how I see because it's because I mean him well why I'm telling him all of this. And as Barry Salmon mentioned, this is a time where everyone is enjoying everything. They're eating and they're drinking, but they have to remember, everybody has to remember who plant and who prepare the food. So, yeah. Once again, from ourselves here at World of Reggae, really appreciate your time today and thank you so much for sharing your in- life insight, one love. It was a pleasure talking to you, you know, and we just want to say that we want to continue to feed souls with positive music to teach and educate to unite the world music is the only weapon that we can use to unite the world we want more love no war music is love and life so keep the fire burning thank you so much one love one love